No, I don't think that's the way heaven actually going to work. We're not preaching the philosophy of this movie, but I show you this clip because we are talking about your soul, and that clip tells you some very important things about the state of Joe's soul. First of all, Joe is not ready to die. Whoever is. I guess the 106-year-old lady was interested. But um, here's some other things that you should know. Joe is putting more effort in getting back to his life than he ever put in actually living his life. Did you catch it? He thinks life owes him. I'm due. I'm overdue is what he says. Here's the sad thing. The only thing he's interested in getting back to is some event. This idea that he's got this gig to go play, and, and that's his whole purpose. You know what's the most amazing thing about that clip? And maybe it didn't dawn on you, so let me point it out to you. When Joe first started up the escalator to the great light, he was all alone. And the funny thing is, he really wasn't ever alone, because when he turned and he ran away, what did you see? All the other souls that were there. Isn't that how we get a lot of times in our life? We think we are in this life, and we are riding along in it, and even though we can see everybody around us, we think it's all about us, and I am all alone in this quest to find God. The soul of the matter. Folks, we have a lot to cover today, so I am going to try my best to stick to the script and not ramble, or you will be here a very long time because there is a lot of territory to cover. You are designed to live in relationships, not events. So life is not about just a series of events that you're supposed to accomplish, and then you're done. I say relationships because, yes, the world, that word is plural. You are designed to live in multiple relationships throughout your entire earthly lives. And in case you missed the memo, people are exhausting. And every relationship you get into is going to exhaust you. Now, not all relationships are the same because you are designed to live on multi-leveled relationships. There are physical relationships, and well, these are the most shallow. It's usually based on attraction. You see somebody and they look like you or they think like you, or maybe they root for the same football team that you root for. There, there is something that attracts you to them, but it's usually something that's physical. Then we go a little deeper in our relationships, and we get to the mental, and that's more informational. I know about the person, right? I know the person's name and maybe where they live and maybe some fun facts about them, but it's still all a mental thing. And as I continue to hang out and the relationship grows, we get to the emotional aspect of the relationship. And that's when we actually start to uh, form some attachment, okay? Those are those ishy-gushy feelings that you get in the pit of your stomach. Those are the things that you long for. them with your kids, they're the ones that when they move away from college, you're like, I miss them. That, that's an emotional state. But that's not the crux of a relationship. It's this word, soul. And there's a funny thing about your soul when you actually reach this point of a relationship, there is a dependence upon that person. That if that person goes away, or if that person is not, alone, is not around you, it's not just I miss them, there's a part of me that's missing, and, and that's a relationship. That's a deep relationship that I don't think we get to a lot in our life. And here's another thing that you should know about your relationship. Did you know... You were designed to have a soulmate. Now, don't worry, I'm not about to give you um, tips on how to update your dating profile. Um, I'm not going to let you sit here and tell you that if you're single, there's something wrong with you and that you were designed to live in a relationship. As a matter of fact, I'm about to tell you the opposite, okay? Because this is not about soulmate as we think about it. This is how we think about a soulmate. A person ideally suited to another as a close friend or romantic partner. That's how we view this idea of soulmate. And when we look at the idea of soulmate, we need to understand what we usually think about 
is the fact that they are there for self-satisfaction. They are there to satisfy me. Everybody here remembers the Jerry Maguire movie when they're looking at each other, and he's, she's like, you complete me. That, that's not a soulmate. Um, that's not a person that you're going to find here because this causes a problem because it puts humanity on a never-ending quest to find our soulmate. And you know what? It started from the very beginning of time. I appreciate Rich's communion meditation. It's going to tie very nicely into our sermon this morning. But here's what we're going to have to do for you to understand the concept of soulmate. I'm going to have to send you to school, God's school of relationship. We're going to be in that book of Genesis about right where Rich was, and I'm going to give you three quick lessons that you need to understand about relationships and soulmates. Lesson number one, you can't go it alone. You can't be Joe on the escalator and your life is all about you. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he, had, he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. First lesson God had to teach was an object lesson. He couldn't explain the concept of relationship to Adam. So he said, hey, let me give you an object lesson, an experience for you to file away. And so he gave the man a task. He said, okay, you see all these creatures out here? Give them a name. And Adam did that, and as he was giving them a name, he said, hey, elephant, dog, cat, I don't know, I'll come back to you. And then he gave all the names. He said, wait a minute. There's something wrong with this picture. All of these pictures are in pairs. Everything has a partner. And well, um, God, where's mine? Where's my soulmate? Where, where's my complement? What's supposed to complete me? Now, we covered this at length in Agnosium in the Creator series Last, last year, we're not going to go back down that sermon, but I have to remind you of that. Story of the way, lesson number two. Relationships, they're going to cost you. That's how they work. Make no mistake about it, Eve was going to cost Adam something. You see, um, when Adam saw Eve, what's the first thing he thought about? What all guys think about making babies, right? He's thinking, man, yeah, this is a girl. We're going to make a family. We're going to have all these pieces. But, but Eve, well, she was uniquely designed for Adam. Think about this for a second. Physically, they fit. I'm not giving you that lesson. If you need that lesson, come see me in private. We'll have that conversation. But they fit together. They were designed that way, okay? Um, mentally, they were on equal ground. It didn't say that Adam was smarter than Eve or Eve was smarter. They were taken one from the, Adam, Eve was taken from Adam. They were mentally the same. Um, emotionally, boy, Adam got this one right, didn't he? He said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she is taken out of man. Emotionally, the moment Adam saw her, there was an emotional attachment there to this woman. And spiritually, boy, we miss this sometimes. They were both created in the image of God. Adam wasn't created in the image of God, and Eve was a secondary knockoff. Okay, They were both created in the image of God. So guess what that means? She was not there to change the diapers. She was not there to cook the meals. She was not there to clean the house. This was about helping humanity understand the concept of soul. And you know what? This is the lesson that Adam needed to learn. 
Eve cost Adam part of himself. What did it say? So the Lord God caused the man to fall asleep. And while he was sleeping, he took the man's ribs. By the way, the word rib there should be side. So he took a side of man and then closed up the flesh. And guess what? That's how it came into being. And if people would just understand this about relationships, relationship will cost you something, amazing things would happen. Divorce rates would plummet. Family life would become stable. There are a few dot-com businesses that would go belly up. And, well, um, probably a large majority of the hate in the world would magically disappear. All because they understand this concept. You see, if you want to have a relationship, you must be willing to sacrifice part of your self. You can't go into a relationship and keep all of you and expect the relationship to work. It's a sacrifice thing. But now I have a newsflash for you. Eve was not Adam's soulmate. What? Eve was not put there to complete Adam's soul. She was there to teach him some lessons about it. But Eve was not Adam's soulmate. She did not complete Adam, although she did make him happy for a while. Even that ended, Rich covered, and then all of a sudden... Adam wasn't so happy with Eve after they ate the fruit, and there were all kind of things that went along with it. But you do understand. Adam was 100% complete the day God created him. As a matter of fact, to make Eve, he had to take part of Adam out to make Eve. So Adam, the idea of Eve was not to give Adam a soulmate because Adam already had a soulmate, it says that he, she was to be a helper, one that was going to help Adam through his life to teach him, and consequently, he's going to teach her. It's a two-way street. So that brings us to um, lesson three. And um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell you anything you didn't already know, right? Relationships are complicated. Um, before the concept of family really ever existed, Adam knew that to have a new relationship, you would have would be taking from an existing relationship. Don't you see how that works? Don't you see that that's how God intended for it to work? That's what Adam said. Th that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. So Adam knew this relationship is a complicated thing. And you know what? It's going to be painful. There is no relationship in the universe that's worth having that has not cost you some pain. That's how relationships work. They are indeed painful. And as Adam is looking at that, he knows it. But you know what? There's somebody else that, that's watching this conversation, and that's God. And here's the thing. As he's watching, he hears those words. Therefore shall a man leave his father. Wait a minute. To have this relationship with Eve, Adam was going to have to borrow from another relationship. And what's the only other relationship he had to borrow from? The relationship with God. And so as Adam began to make these choices, eventually it happened just the way Adam said it. He was a prophet and didn't even know it. He prophesied, eventually, I have to put my relationships in a pecking order. And unfortunately, Adam decided his soulmate was Eve and not who his soulmate really was designed to be. This is the story, as Rich kind of shared with us earlier. Let me give you the recap. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining the wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. 
And the eyes of them were both opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Adam was there. He saw that Eve had eaten. Adam now had a choice. Go to God and tell God what happened and ask God to forgive Eve or make Eve my soulmate. And God, I'm sorry, this relationship is more important than that relationship, and so I am going to borrow from this relationship and give it to this relationship. And so he ate to become like Eve. We miss that. Adam could have ran to God and said, God, fix this for me. Forgive her. What do you want? He could have pleaded. But he decided, there's the escalator. There's the light. That's God. And I'm on the escalator all by myself. How do I fix it? And then the funny thing happened. Once they decided that they were going to do it their way, Adam made his choices. They began to try to cover themselves, and guess who shows up? Adam's soulmate came looking for him. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord of God and was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they, and they hid, from him and the Lord God, hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to the man, where are you? Isn't that fascinating. God knew exactly what had happened. This was not a game of hide and seek where God couldn't find them, but God wanted the man to call out to him. Why? Because your soul was designed for multiple relationships, but the primary relationship your soul was designed for was a relationship with God. That's your soul's mate. And we miss this, and I miss this, because oftentimes I am looking for other people to complete me, and God said, no, you are complete in me. So here's the question for your soul this morning. Where are you? Okay, physically, I get where you are. You're at 333 Churchville Avenue, Stanton, Virginia. At least you're physically here. Mentally, you may be somewhere else this morning. Emotionally, you may still be back in the bed, snuggling underneath your covers. I, I don't know where all, all the rest of you is, but, but I want to know spiritually this morning. Where are you? And here's the thing. Are you interested in finding your soul's mate? I don't know. That, that sounds hard. Well, let me give you a quick reminder. This is going to summarize all of last sermon in one sentence. You might think, well, we could have just skipped last week. You could have just given me the sentence, and then I wouldn't have had to set through a 30-minute sermon. Yeah, but you needed the rest of it to go with it. But here's the summary. God breathed into us our soul. That's why I know he's the soulmate, because he's the one that put it there. And it was the only way to have a real relationship with us. God already had cats and dogs and elephants and rhinos and hippos and monkeys and all the other things. And God looked at them, and you know what he said? Where's mine? I, I like all these creatures that I created, but guess what? My relationship with them is much different than the one I'm about to make when I formed man and breathed soul into them is because I want to have a real, honest to goodness relationship. And just so you know, this was a risky move for God. But you were worth the risk. A relationship with you was worth the risk to God to breathe into humanity soul. And then to help us understand relationship, well, he created multi-tiered, multi-dimensional relationships here on earth. And again, they are exhausting because people are exhausting. But you need to know there is no relationship outside of heaven that is ever going to complete your soul. Don't believe me? Don't you see it? Divorce rates keep riding, rising. Why? Because marriage doesn't complete my soul. We keep looking for new ways to define the word love. Why? 
because my soul was incomplete. We keep feeding our soul physical stuff, mental stuff, emotional stuff, and our soul is screaming out, I am starving for the spiritual stuff. Where is my soul's mate? And we just keep looking. And before you tell me that I'm off my rocker and I've got this all wrong, then let me just ask you some serious questions. If your junk food diet of which you're feeding your soul is working, why do you still want more? Last night I was watching my football game and I got my little bag of potato chips because I know better than to get the big bag because you know what's going to happen if I eat, get the big bag, right? I'm going to eat the whole bag. So I get the little bag, hoping that I eat the one little bag and then I stop. Because what do they say about Lay's potato chips? You can't eat just one. And you understand that all the stuff that I'm trying to feed my soul, the what I look at, the what I think, the what I feel, and my soul is like, you missed it. I'm starving. I want more. If um, it's really working, then tell me why is all of humanity still looking for something, and we use this word a lot, real. What, is everything else fake? All those relationships I had in my past, are they all fake? No. They were real. The problem is, it's just they were wrong relationships to feed my soul. Because there is no human out here that can complete me. I have something to try very hard. But they can't. It can't be done. Because your soul wasn't designed to be completed by humanity. It was to be complemented by your human relationships. Your soul is only complete when there is God in the middle of it. Here's an interesting question. If you found the answers in the mountains of self-help books you have, you, you bought, why are the bookstores still in business? If I could go to Barnes & Noble or sign on to Amazon, because I don't go to any store these days, I, I like my smile boxes. If, if I could solve my problems with a self-help book, then why are they still in business and why do they still keep writing them? Well, it's because I'm feeding my soul something to say this is going to fix it this time. It's not working. I've got shelves of them at home. We have a box of self-help books that's underneath our house that we bought over the years and it's just, we read them, but it's not fixing anything. It's not completing my soul. If I've got all of the right ingredients, then um, why do I have to keep redefining relationship? Think about what we're doing in our society. I mean, when I was kid, when I was a kid, relationships happened this way, and you know now I'm watching my kids do things, and relationships seem to be, they they define them differently than I used to define them. And I hate to tell you guys this, if we go on more generation, you're the next generation. We we keep redefining relationship because guess what? The relationship that I'm having here on earth, they're not feeding my soul. My soul is still crying out and saying, "I'm lost. Where am I?" And so we just keep coming up with. New definition after new definition after new definition. And here's the question. This is the crux of the matter. Are you satisfied? For a moment, just kind of quickly categorize all the relationships and all the people that you know, whether they're family or work or friends or people that you pass on the street. Which one of those relationships 100% satisfy you? I gotta be careful I say this because my family is but sitting here, but they already know the answer to this. None. None of those relationships 100% satisfy me because all of them have flaws in them. And when they have flaws in them, I am so very good at picking at their flaws because you're not meeting the need that I want you to. You aren't completing me. Yeah, no kidding, guess what? They can't do it. They can spend a lifetime trying. They can't do it because they are not your soulmate. 
They are an individual that God put into your life to teach you something about how to have a relationship. But they aren't the crux of the relationship. I was a youth minister for many, 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 many years, and I have taught lots and lots and lots of dating classes and sex classes and other classes. And here's the thing. I can never get a teenage to understand this. I've tried. But you know what? I can never get an adult to understand this because I've tried teaching myself this, and a lot of times I still do it. I'm still on junk food diets when it comes to relationships, hoping that I'm going to find some moment in life where somebody completes me, and they can't do it. And then I'm disappointed in them when they can't, and I get frustrated when I can't, and that's why things continue to go the way they are. So, here's the thing I want you to see. Adam made a huge mistake that we are repeating over and over again. And it had absolutely, positively, nothing to do with the idea of eating fruit. It had nothing to do with the idea of, hey, God, where is mine? Because guess what? That was actually God's idea. God set Adam up to realize you wanted something else. Adam's mistake, here it is, if you get this and you put this away and you file this away, your life will change immensely. Adam's mistake was when he understood lonely, he looked to creation for his solution and not the creator. God, make me something else. Because God, you are not enough for me. Adam looked out there across the, those animals and he, um, he was jealous. They have something I don't have. They have a partner, somebody to cuddle with under a blanket on a cold night. You know what didn't wrap through Adam's brain for even a second? He never considered he's had something they would never understand. They had no soul. They had no portion of God living within him that longed in them, that longed to be in God's presence. Even after they had sinned. Adam and Eve still knew they needed to be in God's presence. That's why they went and they started sowing leaves together and I'm going to make myself acceptable to God. You get it? I'm fixing your entire life for you in the moment and I'm not even charging you for, for a fee to come in. God says this is the way it's supposed to work. He's supposed to be your soulmate. Now just like in the garden when, Adam, when God cried out, where are you? Lo and behold, as time went on, our soulmate physically came looking for us in the form of Jesus. And I love the Jesus mission statement. We see this, what, about 20 times a year. I love to put this scripture on the screen just so you are reminded. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And just so you don't get the wrong picture, he didn't come looking for your body. He didn't come looking for your brain. He didn't even come looking for your heart. He came looking for your soul. He came looking for that piece of you that is so far inside of you, that is designed to connect to God. And Jesus said, that's what I am looking for. And he knows all about you. That's kind of scary. But guess what? He knows you're lost. He knows you've done things in your life that you've tried desperately to keep him from finding, and he knows that you've sewn together parts of your life so that you can cover this or cover that, and he knows that there are parts of your life that you're hiding. He knows all of this. He knows you, you're lost. How do you know that I know that he knows that I'm lost? Well, because he breathed into your soul, and when he breathed in your soul, he gave you a piece of himself so now that you are no longer in fellowship with him, he knows that you have a disconnect and he misses that piece of himself. That is in each and every one of us. And this is not a new age philosophy. This is a very biblical concept here, folks. God breathed your soul into you and he knows it's lost. And here's the other thing that he knows. He knows we're looking for a way out. I love that thing where Joe is clawing against the wall, trying to rip a hole in the fabric of death to get back to his life because he knows we're looking for a way out of this endless 
cycle that I'm in of relationship after relationship after relationship letting me down and failing me. I'm looking for something more, God. And you know what? Jesus says, I know that. I know you're looking for a way out. Um, he knows you're lonely. Boy, do we forget that a lot of times. You think God understands lonely? Jesus does. How do I know? On the cross. Just before he was about to give his spirit, it says that God forsook him. Now, I can't wrap my brain around how God forsakes God, but in that instance of time, Jesus experienced what we experienced in the fact that he was disconnected from the Father for the first time in his life, and he understood the concept of I am lonely. We're on the escalator, and we're all by ourselves. And all we can see is this bright light. But he knows. You're lonely. He knows that um, you're tired of your hungry soul. He's watched. He's seen how you stuff it. Now, here's something that I do want to make sure you understand. When we choose to come back to God, Adam and Eve were so um, sure that God was going to judge them. And there were consequences to sin. I'm not going to tell you that this is a get out of jail free card. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19 says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act results in justification in life for all people. Well, thus, just as though, just as through disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, also through the obedience of one man, many were made righteous. This doesn't do away with the sin issue when you decide to latch onto your soulmate. You see, that's not the way this works. What it does do is it gives you that person that can actually complete you back in your life, that person you were designed for. It gives you an open relationship with God. That was the introduction to the sermon, by the way. It's a short sermon, long introduction. Here's the thing about life. When you're ready, this is what God said in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 28 through 31. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone which cannot see, hear, or eat, or smell. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul, when you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is, merc is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you, or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed with them by an oath. And I gotta tell you something. I read that and I'm thinking, could it really be this simple? There's not another book I have to buy. I don't have to perform some ritualistic act to, 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 to find my soulmate. There's not a riddle I have to solve where I have to come up with the right answer. Surely there's got to at least be a secret handshake that I have to learn, something that I have to do so that I can actually find my soulmate. Barry, you're telling me that, that this, is, this is way too simple. I've been feeding my soul junk food for so long, you can't tell me all I needed was this. Yeah. Isn't that what God tells us? When you are ready... I'm here. When you're tired of your broken soul, God says, I'm here. Now, unfortunately, he tells us some other things in this passage of Scripture. He says, um, you're going to look in all the wrong places. And that what he says, you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, 
which cannot hear, eat, or smell. He tells the Israelites, you're going to go everywhere possible to try to fix this problem. You're even going to get so down that you're going to get a tree and you're going to carve an idol and you're going to step there and you say, that completes my soul. That's the relationship. God knows you're, you're going to look everywhere. You know what else he tells you? Um, he tells us we probably won't get there until we're at the end of our rope. We don't usually go looking for our soulmate when things are going good in my life, right? Matter of fact, usually when we are, things are going good in my life, I really go looking for no more relationships because I understand people are exhausting, and the second I start looking for more relationships, I'm just going to mess everything up, so I'll just stick with the ones I've got, right? Um, but when I'm at the end of my rope and I've tried everything else, all of a sudden God becomes um, kind of interesting. He says, when you are distressed and all of these things have happened to you, you're going to have to go through some rough times before you make the decision to go seeking God. And unfortunately, he tells us that many times we're not even going to look until we're old. Then in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey him, which means, quite frankly, God knows that for a lot of people, you're going to waste your entire life looking for God or looking to feed your soul. And it isn't until you're old that you find, like, well, I've tried everything else. I may as well give God a try now. That's the way it works a lot of times. But the amazing thing, even with all of those things, which would give most of us the ability to just walk away from a relationship, God says, I'm going to be merciful for you. And when I am merciful for you, even though you abandon me, I won't abandon you. I'm not going to ignore you. Even though you have tried to destroy me by saying there is no God, I'm still going to love you, and I'm not going to destroy you. God says, hey, even though I have to come looking for you and you try to forget all about me, I'm not going to forget you. And then he looks at you, and this is kind of like one of those almost a wedding ceremony look. And he says, you know what? I give you my word. The moment you try to seek me, it isn't going to be a long journey. All you have to do is turn around and see me. So here's the question. Folks here in the building, those online, those will be tuning in later because you have other things in your life this morning. Have you met your soul's mate in the person of Jesus? That's the question I have for you this morning. And you know what? For you, there's only one person that can answer that. That would be you. Have you met him? And more importantly, do you have a relationship with him? I'm going to ask